so just let me know if you once you can um, see my screen. So as you all know, we are this is one book one Windsor event, and the how we came about this book is um, a bunch of people from the town of Windsor submitted books that they they wanted to read as a community, and then the commission we voted on the books. There were I think like I think there were almost like thirty five books, so we had to like. <laughs> There were a lot of books. So we, we put all of the books on a list. We had a summary of each of the books. And then as a commission, all of us voted on the top three. And this one is the one that had the most votes from everyone. And it's called Across That Bridge, um, A Vision for Change and the Future of America by John Lewis. He was one of the United States congressmen and civil rights leaders. So a lot of this book talks about his experiences and a lot of different main points that we can learn from in terms of leadership and education. So the small snippet we're about to hear is going to be a, like a very small audio excerpt from the book itself. So let me share. All right, can everybody see it? Yeah. Excellent. All right, I'm gonna make sure the volume's up all the way and he read it himself. So it's excellent. Even as a boy, I knew in my heart and soul that the equality of all humankind was not just a dream. Children growing up in inhumane conditions are not carefree. They sense that something is wrong and embark on an inner search to explain so much that is not in keeping with their hearts. At a young age, I mourned for the experience of a more loving world. My soul insisted that there was a better way. Many of us who joined the struggle of respect for human dignity, both black and white, Protestant and Jew, had been locked in cognitive dissonance for years. By the time we were seasoned freedom fighters, it was more real to us than our own flesh and blood, more real than our own lives, and more valuable than our own longevity. We believed that if we are all children of the same creator, then discrimination had to be an error, a misconception based on faulty logic. The idea that some people were inherently better was a delusion of the human ego, a distortion of the truth. We asserted our right to human dignity based on a solid faith in our divine heritage that linked us to every other human being and all the rest of creation, known and unknown, even to the heart and mind of God and the highest celestial realms in the universe. This unity was an intrinsic, inseparable aspect of our being. We had nothing to prove. Our worth had already been established before we were born. Our protests were an affirmation of this faith our belief that we could never be separated from this truth. It did not matter that hundreds of years of unjust law and demeaning customs were tied to this wrong-headed thinking, or that the history of an entire nation had been shaped by this error in judgment. We believed that if we were the children of an omniscient creator, and we took a stand based on faith that the forces of the universe would come to our aid, no jail cell, no threat, no act of violence could alter our power to overcome any adversary if we did not waver. Your faith has the power to sustain you through the worst you can imagine. You may have heard this somewhere before in your life. Religious leaders teach about faith on holy days. You might read about it in self-help books, pop psychology, or spiritual literature. People pat you on the back when they know you are going through a hard time and encourage you to have faith as a way to comfort you. Few would disagree with the idea that faith has power, but often this truth does not become meaningful to us until we are tested by a challenge we think we may not survive. It is then that we experience how transformative our capacity to believe truly is. Tragedy is the great equalizer, and no individual, regardless of wealth or fame, can escape the challenge tragedy brings. 
if one primary purpose in our lives is to cast off all illusions and awaken to the eternal knowledge of what is truly real, then tragedy can be viewed as an equal opportunity aid to our development. The problems we face in the trials of our lives, whether we are standing in protest against injustice or fighting cancer, battling addictions or bankruptcy, our problems can help each of us grow beyond our personal limits. Our problems initiate a struggle within our own souls that take us to the brink of our own experience. As we command our spirit to find a way to overcome these obstacles, we are forced to break past any false trappings of the identity and to focus intensely on what is real and what is truly important. Mother Teresa was asked where she found her strength, her focus, her fuel. The fuel, she explained, is prayer. To keep a lamp burning, we have to keep putting oil in it. And that's our excerpt. It's um, a mosh posh of um, different parts of the book. So um, it is definitely a very powerful book. If you haven't get the chance, you can listen to it or you can um, uh, pick up a copy at our local library. Um, but for our panelists today, um, I'm going to have you share a bit about yourselves. Um, I know we have uh, Jakai Edwards, Denisha Noble, and Adriana Sowell. Um, thank you so much again for being our phenomenal panelists. I'm going to stop my screen share for now. Um, but I'm going to give you each a couple minutes to introduce yourself. What brought you here to this amazing <laughs> book discussion? <laughs> Denisha, would you like to go first? Yes, hi, my name is Denisha Noble. I am a sophomore at Central Connecticut State University. I am a cybersecurity major and minoring in political science. And I'm here because I am one of the inaugural scholars here at Central for the John Lewis Institute. So it was um, my program advisor, she saw this and sent it and I was like, I would like to be a part of this. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thanks so much for coming. So grateful to have you. Um, Jakai, would you like to go next? Yes. Um, hi, my name is Jakai Edwards, and I am uh, actually one of the co-directors for education for the National Black Cooperative. Uh, it's actually a social activist group that myself, Costella, and Adriana are on. Um, and I'm also, I also work for a nonprofit uh, organization here in New York called Posse, and I'll be one year panelist for this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Jakai. So excited to have you. And last but not least, Adriana, introduce yourself. Hey, thank you, Cassie. Hello. Um, I'm Adriana Sowa. I'm a recent graduate from UConn with a um, bachelor's in social medical sciences. Um, I'm also the president of the National Black Cooperative um, that Cassie and Jakai are a part of. Um, and I also work as a research assistant at UConn Health. But that's a little bit about me, but I'm really excited to be here. And thank you so much, Cassie, for inviting me. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you so much for being here. And I think we're gonna have a great conversation today. A part of our conversation here is gonna really um, depend on um, our guidelines and expectations for each other. I know um, a little bit about me, I'm a classroom teacher. So I teach a lot of young children and I, something that I have for um, kids or adults, no matter what age or what classroom I go into, we have expectations to uphold to. So the first one that we're going to have in this space is speak from the eye. So speaking from your own experience. And we can definitely get some great lessons about how John Lewis does that in the book. Um, listen to understand one another. I know we are in such a world of clickbait and just information all day, every day. So it's nice to have a moment to really understand one another from where we're coming. Uh, leaning into discomfort and feelings, because I know sometimes a lot of feelings will come up when we have uh, these discussions around um, race and other topics. Um, confidentiality, so it's kind of like the Vegas rule, uh, what the, a lot of the personal stories that we share with each other stay here, but the main lessons that we learn will leave and go out into the community. 
Uh, we have be respectful. So online, that looks like um, just staying muted when others are sharing. You can also type in the chat if you have a question to myself or any others, you can just put, post that in the chat and we will talk about that um, as some of our main points. You can participate and converse. I always challenge people um, if this is like a challenge by choice activity. So you don't have to speak if you don't want to, but I encourage you to because the more you put in, the more you're gonna get out of the conversation. And finally, agree to disagree with Grace because there's times where I might I might have a point or someone else might have a point and you can you might just disagree and that's totally okay. I, I often encourage people. It's just like we can just agree to disagree, but we can still be respectful and cordial about it. So um, those are our guidelines and expectations. Um, does that does that sound good to everybody? Awesome. Thanks for the thumbs and the head nods. Excellent, thanks. Here's our brief agenda in case you would like to see a little scope and sequence. So I'm just gonna very briefly, I'll try to do this in like five, 10 minutes so that way we can just get to our panelists. Um, I think we're gonna just provide a common ground. So that's gonna be the purpose of the event. Some context if in case some of you have read the book or are familiar with John Lewis's work, or if you're not, we'll all have the same, the same common ground that we're gonna uh, have a conversation on. I have two starter questions for our panelists. We're gonna pause so that way if the audience has questions, that will be a great time for you to, to follow up on any major points that were made. Um, then we're gonna have two more questions and then um, we're gonna have closing thoughts and feelings with our final remarks. So the purpose of this event is to really have a conversation with one another about the main ideas from across that bridge and to reflect on what type of change can happen. Um, I know I read the introduction of this book and was, it's actually one of the best introductions I've ever read from books. I've read a lot of books, but like this one is actually one of the best that I've ever read in my opinion. Um, so I think that he, he gives us a lot of different tools and things that we're gonna talk about um, and really reflect on what we can bring back into each of our spaces and communities. And speaking of communities and spaces, I have a couple quotes, um, really big quotes from the book. Um, from uh, John Lewis, and he said, do not get lost in a sea of despair. Do not become bitter or hostile. Be hopeful, be optimistic. Never ever be afraid to make some noise and get in good trouble, necessary trouble. We will find a way to make a way out of no way. And uh, another one that really stuck with me personally is freedom is not a state, it is an act. It is not some enchanted garden perched high on a distant plateau where we can finally sit down and rest. Freedom is the continuous action we all must take and each generation must do its part to create an even more fair, more just society. And finally, here are some salient points. I know after reading the book, um, he has, I think like seven acts, including faith, patience, study, truth, act, peace, love, and reconciliation. So he, he went and went into a lot of detail about what it meant in terms of his life as a leader. Um, and and each, each of the chapters or sections, um, he gave two or three main experiences that focused on faith or focused on how study really helped within the civil rights movement or within a certain part of his life. And he really uses his own experiences to, to provide an example of what change can look like and how it's a journey over time. Um, so I know we're gonna get to chat a bit about some of those um, examples. And across that bridge later on um, towards the end of the book, you realize it's not just like a physical symbol of him and many other civil rights leaders and when they crossed that bridge together in Selma, but how it's a metaphor about um, how this dream is us. So we're going to talk about what, what does that bridge mean in terms of action today? And a lot of this is how we walk together over different challenges and bridges. That's a main thread that I, I saw um, that he was presenting throughout the book. Um, and um, Representative John Lewis, unfortunately, he did pass away on 717, I think um, last year or so, 2021. Um, so I know he left this book and it's a, a huge part of his legacy. 
Um, before we get started on our questions, does anyone have any like questions or comments um, before I turn it over to our panelists? Again, tried to do it super brief so we all have a common ground and now we can get to the fun stuff. <laughs> Excellent. I'm going to also copy these um, questions in the chat. So if you want to look at these and kind of take some more time, I know I'm a reader, so I try to like really think about each of these questions. Um, but the first question that I have for our panelists is in your own words, describe what John Lewis's vision of changes because I know there's all this talk in Black History Month and we got to change and we got to do all this stuff. And I'm like, well, what does that even look like? <laughs> um, so Adriana, you want to go first? Yes, yeah, sounds like a plan. Um, first, thank you for that intro. And I definitely like felt your point about the intro being like very like invigorating because when I was reading, I was like, oh my gosh, this is like hitting all the points and it was just so wellly like arced out. But as far as um, in my words, describe what John Lewis's vision of change means to me, I would say like the the titles of like the chapters first, like really set like the groundwork, the idea of like faith and having like the ability to believe through the worst and using faith, faith as a touch point to like reimagine and allow reimagination and how important reimagination, reimagination and the belief in that reimagination is in order to like proceed even in the times where like the light seems dimmed, as we talked about the end and reconciliation, how like sometimes our light become, can become so dim that we can't, um, we don't even recognize that it's there. Um, but like that belief, that faith in that, like we can get through this and that we are going to be like agents for change, I think is something that really like sets the tone. And then also like with that faith, the, the need to be able to be patient and like to continue forward and like how studying and like standing on the shoulders of giants, so, like the studying of, what has come before and what is to come come after kind of like you know sets you on that path um but generally like speaking in totality i think like the idea of just like collective power is something that like rang true to me where he talks about the collective power of this of the people is not only material emotional um and economic resource but also a spiritual force as well really getting back to like the, the importance of like faith being like the grounding work that like propels um you to like continue on through this fight, um, I think it's something really important as far as change goes, like the continued belief in that this is not as good as it gets, I'm gonna to continue to fight and create ways and do the work to change um, as it's a continuous act, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, thanks so much for sharing, because I think it's like, it's a, I really like how you're capturing like collectivism about how like we have to be in this together and it's over time. Right. So I know he gave an example of like um, the marathon and how he had to wait like 10 years for one policy to change. And I was like, you had so much. He talks about it in patience. And he was like, oh, yeah, it took me like 15 years to see this change that I was like, you must have so much patience <laughs> to see like to see that from start to end. 15 years like, oh, like props. <laughs> yeah. So excellent. Thank you for sharing, Adriana. Denisha, would you like to share next? Yeah, I would have to say like um, his vision of change is like you really have to like vision what you need to do to get there because I remember just, um, I read the other book, uh, I forgot what it was called, but um, we were talking about it and you really think like he had to go through such abuse, such verbal abuse, physical abuse, mental abuse, emotional abuse, um getting thrown in jail and everything so you have to really think like how far are you willing to take yourself to change because there's some stuff that like you 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 have to take you have to take the pain sometimes you have to be thrown in jail you have to do this and that and so it's just like what are you willing to do to kind of push the barrier and bring yourself to that because without the people who are the boundary pushers we wouldn't be what we are today right now. And I think that's what John Lewis is saying. Like, it's like, it doesn't matter what you do, but how far are you willing to take it to reach your goal? Because that's what it is. Like, you just need to push like harder. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Cause I think we live in like, again, like we're in a society where it's like, oh, it's cute to be like a part of social justice, but like we have to constantly keep like holding one another accountable. It's not just, oh, it's not just another hashtag. It's more of like a 
more of an action that we have to continue onwards and keep and keep going onwards. So um, thank you so much for sharing. All right, Jakai, go ahead. In your own words, what is John Lewis's vision of, of change in your opinion? Thank you. Um, well, I really wanted to definitely highlight and affirm what Adriana and Denisha were saying about just like reimagination and just like pushing boundaries. I think John Lewis, like we kind of said, had a lot of patience for sure, but I think his vision of change was definitely like a desire for a, not only a, ju a more just society, but also to kind of have the, um, I guess, pushing yourself to also have that reimagination of more of what our society is like just at the forefront or what we're actually just like seeing right in front of us. You know, I think it's easy to kind of see the constant dehumanization or just the trauma that is really just in our faces really frequently. And I think it's easy to definitely get in despair, feel pessimistic. And although all those uh, feelings are valid, um, I think what John Lewis wanted was to definitely, he wanted people to sort of be able to look inward and kind of do the work of definitely kind of pushing yourself, which ultimately will allow you to kind of push your community and then like kind of push the nation. And uh, I think what he really wanted was to, for us to reimagine the world in a way that we, what we wanted to look like and to be agents of change for that. And in order to be agents of change, we had to be the change that we actually want to see. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thanks so much for sharing. Because I think that that was a definitely a big thread where he was talking about like all of that inner work, where everyone just expects that like things change or like, oh, this external thing will happen. When really, I, I really appreciate you bringing that up, Chikai. It's like how there's it's an internal, like spiritual, mental process over time that's constantly going to be um, changing. And that kind of is a great segue into our next question. Um, and this one is kind of turning not only from the internal, but into the external. So John Lewis discusses how we, the people, must take responsibility in the democratic process. This is mainly in the later half um, um, after the study chapter and how we take action and reconciliation. Um, so what does this mean in our current political atmosphere of just transitioning with our presidents and like the local elections kind of what does that mean to take responsibility? Because um, I know he gave us a lot of different points on how we have to be patient on how we have to take action and have faith. But what does that mean um, to you? So we'll start here with Donisha. What does that mean to you in our current political state? <laughs> uh, what it means to me is that the, the internet can be very, very dangerous, especially with my generation, how we love being on tablets, phones, computers, um, how literally any clickbait will just draw us to that article and we just read it and we're like, oh, well, I'm side with the with this article. And you read another article that truly contradicts it. And like, actually, I'm going to switch my mind. I'm going to go with this article now. And then like, it's that back and forth. So I feel like our generation, like my generation really needs to like sit down and actually like read about the whole democratic process because really sad how um like a lot of people just just don't know the process at all and we need to really just go back to that kind of stage like it's not just republican and democrat there's green party there's the liberal party there's way there's way more to voting and you need to know more about the candidate you may not like one candidate, but you need to know like sometimes their views align with your views a lot more, but you just don't like them because of how the how the internet just like poses them and everything. So I would definitely have to say like in modern society, it's more about the technology side of the democratic process because you know technology is it's a part of our life. There's like no way of like taking it out of our life now. So it's more like how to kind of safeguard it and make sure the white the right word is getting out and our and this generation and for our future posterity is to know like how to really just kind of venture from which is a true source and which you can really get to a read and which is just like total like total nonsense and that you shouldn't read at all. 
Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thanks so much for sharing. Cause I know that in this, uh, I think it was a third chapter. I got the book right here in study. He was really talking about that and how it's just like, you really need to like, not only like read it for the information, but to like understand and comprehend what you're reading, especially in the society. Now I know he didn't really talk as much about technology, but that's such a crucial point with like the electronic votes and all this stuff. So, um, thank you so much. Cause it is, it's an interesting time to live in <laughs> right now. <laughs> Jakai, would you like to go next? Of course. Um, I definitely had a sort of a similar um, interpretation as well. Um, I feel like for me, well, what I think about is how when we're like so young and like getting older, um, we're taught that, you know, kind of the law, law is like the law is God, like the law is everything. You know, we give a lot of importance to legality and law and we're kind of taught to never really question it, even though historically the law hasn't always been in everyone's favor. Governance hasn't always been in everyone's favor and looking out for everybody. Um, so I think, you know, what John Lewis was getting at is as a society, we can't really wait for our government to our government to serve us, uh, serve us what we want or what we need. Um, and I think as a result, in our current political atmosphere, um, it means simply we have to sort of kind of fight for what we want. And I think that can look differently for everyone, um, whether it's kind of just familiarizing yourself with politics, voting, lobbying, running for Senate, et cetera. But I think ultimately um, John Lewis was really hyper aware of the need to rise above like the sort of artificial limitations of uh, tradition and law. And to, I guess, not accept what has always been fed to us as just the status quo. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. He talks about like that preparation, like how how back in the day people would politicians would prepare like what they would say that and like back it up with facts. But then we don't have that nowadays. So how are we the people like you're saying going to get that information, but then it's going to be on us for who we elect and how we elect them. So um, great points. Thank you, Jakai. Adriana, you're up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Going off of like uh, what Denisha and Jakai are saying, and even like Jakai, the last thing you said about like uh, questioning authority, there's a quote in here. He says, all authority emanates from the consent of governed, uh, of the governed and the satisfactor satisfaction of the customer. And somehow we for have for forgotten this fundamental principle and we must right ourselves before the people withdraw their support. And I think, um, it just speaks to the idea that like first you have to study like these systems and structures that we just like know as hegemonic today like we just identify them as like this is the way things are supposed to be like this is the status quo and this is where things go and like how did this become the status quo why did this become the status quo and really like alchemize ourselves with like the history of how this all came to be and once you start to like peel back those layers you understand that like everything this this system was systematically built to structurally violate, violate black and brown people, right? And when you get to that point, you go back to like the faith to be able to like, can we reimagine the system? Can we change the system? And what ways do we want to change it to make it more equitable, right? For people that look like us. And I think when you get to that point, it's like, okay, we understand that we've had the power to sustain the status quo for so long. So then we also have the power to change what the status quo is, right? Because we're the ones that give power, we give credence and give importance to these systems and structures. So it's time for us to take our power back. Because they like our politicians, they don't have they only have power because of us, right? And if we take that power back, we're able to shape and construct systems that truly work for the betterment of us and not just um the better betterment of some. Um and just lastly, I think that means like going into wh whatever is like poignant to you, if that's health justice, looking at laws that like ha have to do with like maternal health and maternal mortality, like how can I be there? Or, like, is that educational equity? Then looking at like books that like ban books, that's a big thing right now, right? Looking at like what why books are getting banned, trying to advocate for those books and not get off ban lists and just seeing what tangible actions you can make on the micro or macro level um, to really like affect your community um, and hopefully spark that change in other areas too. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thanks so much for sharing. Yeah, it's it's definitely that education piece is huge nowadays, especially with like un not only understanding but like having the adequate tools and resources to un to to find your passion. So, thank you so much for um, sharing. So at this point, I know we've already gotten a lot of information <laughs> and a lot of great conversation going on. Um, but I'm going to turn it over to panelists and audience. If you have any questions or comments at this time, we're going to take the next five, 10 minutes to 
um, leave an open space if anyone has anything they would like to share. Go ahead, Deborah. Going to the point that Denisha was talking about um, in terms of the internet and having to be careful and how it can be a very dangerous tool if we're not comfortable. Um, I'm going to say that I have probably learned more about American history, whether it be Black American history, Native American history, just across the gamut. I have learned more as an adult because of the internet than I ever learned when I was going to school. And if we can be careful about judging the sources of information that we're taking in, I think it's a really important source. I'm, I'm, I'm coming to the defense of um, social media right now. Yeah, we need to be careful, but um, I have learned more from what other people know and what other people have posted in terms of credible, credible articles than I ever would know just based on my, my school experience. And I'm bitter about that, I have to say. There's, um, there's a lot, there's so much lacking in our educational system. We shouldn't have to rely on this, but unfortunately some of us do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thanks so much for sharing. Yeah, it's kind of hard to sift your information because then I'll have students who cite The Onion and it's a satirical, <laughs> it's a satirical like piece on like current events. And they're like, is this true? Did someone really like make a pie out of this and this and this? And I'm sitting here like, oh, my gosh, do you know what satire is? And they're like, it's a type of instrument. And I'm like, oh, dear. <laughs> So I can see kind of both those points where it's like, great, I can learn about theory, but then at the same time, it's like, we are in trouble. <laughs> um, Marsha, I saw you had your hand up. <laughs> yeah, one of the things that struck me, and it ties in with what you all are saying, is that the, the truth, and the truth is that we are all one family and that we are bound by love and that we are part of the creator in being so. And I think um, that's the basis of his faith. And I think that what he is saying too is that if we look at everything through this filter, then we can discern what is not true. And I think, you know, he, one of the things, somebody's already touched on this, but, you know, he was saying we need to be, we need to be responsible to remain engaged and informed so that we can't be duped. And I think if we're not going to be duped, if we look at everything in terms of how does that affect our relationships with one another and does it help us be more united or does it divide us? And I think um, that's critical. And, it, and his faith in the truth, and we hear about relative truth these days, and I believe in relative truth, except there is this one truth that we are all part of the same family. So I thought that was one of his strongest points. I think he's fabulous anyway, but that, that's one of the strongest. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thanks so much for sharing, everyone. Yeah, there's a lot of great, great points that he's shared. <laughs> Wendy, go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, I'm in awe of, of everything people are bringing to the table tonight. Wonderful speakers, wonderful stories. Um, I really uh, love this book, and I really love his message. And um, I listened to him speak on C-SPAN about how through your entire life, you're always crossing bridges. You think you've gotten to one point and learned everything you need to know, but then you see before you, there's another bridge to cross and you always have to challenge yourself to cross those bridges. So whether it be you get your education from school or the internet, or listening to people on webinars like this, you always have to challenge yourself, seek that truth, seek credible sources and um, move beyond. And what I also felt that was important and, and I don't know if we've touched on it tonight was he did all of this, no matter what obstacles he, he faced, it was a nonviolent response, which I think is so hard to contain um, anger and rage when you're held back so much and faced with so much um, obstruction. 
Um, the fact that he did it with nonviolence uh, shows so much bravery and courage. So I just think that's something that we we can learn from as well. So thanks. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thanks so much for sharing. Yeah, I know he talks about that too. And I think his patience um, and chapter where he was like, oh, nope, we're going to do it nonviolently. And no matter how long it takes, like if I'm not here, someone else is going to continue that collective love and peace and spirit. And it's just amazing to see. I know he referenced the National African American Museum and how if you track from start to finish, it took 100 years. And it's just like, that's that's bonkers to me. Like, how, why did it take 100 years from from 1890 all the way up through to just get it done? Like, it's just from construction to artifacts. It's just incredible to see how like we can continue to educate ourselves and and be there for one another, whether it's through different forms of electronic or um, like hard copy literature so and that really um one to your point gets um into our next question but before we get into our next question adriana go ahead i see you got a little little hand up there <laughs> yeah as just a quick thought is going off what deborah had said about like how like, like for a lot of people like the internet has been like an access point to like gaining knowledge and i think it says something to like when we talk about like our education system currently and like who gets to create the textbooks and who are their stakeholders who are able to tell our histories, right? And how like, in a lot of ways, the internet has been like the great democratizer in that way, enabling us to tell like a collective history, one that we all have voice in, um, and also tell like, get towards, work towards getting towards that truth that like John Lewis talks about, like really truly getting, having a collective history that we all have voice in, which inevitably, inevitably will like create a more truthful, history truth telling on uh, when it comes to like what what really happened what how these structures came to be and what is problematic and what is good about them um but yeah mm -hmm. oh absolutely that's a great point i know i talked with my dad he's here my dad uh charlie copeland uh he's he's into history as well and he was telling me how mm -hmm. like um you were i know we were talking earlier about like the civil war and how like people didn't know that like the first person who died was like a black person and they were fighting for like the civil war and it's mind boggling to me. I was like, Oh, but I knew that. But like some people were sharing, like you didn't grow up with that. Did you? No, that was the revolutionary war. Oh, dear. My bad. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> See, I'm not, I'm not a history buff. I try to read. I'm still working on that preparation and study. Uh, but yeah, I know you were sharing with that with me earlier about how like, and that's to your point, Adriana, is like, who's writing these books? And now there's a big change and a big push. And anytime I educate children or, or high schoolers or whoever it is, it's just like, they don't realize they're like, oh, well, we automatically like get and deserve this. And I'm like, growing up, like we didn't see that as much. And that's a part of that study and that, that love and peace and really getting to the truth of it all. Um, so I just wanted to bring up those points, um, because it really gets into our next question about like, what does it mean to go across that bridge? It's like such a deep and heavy metaphor. And I'm sure he thought very long and hard about like what to call this book. And what, anytime I think about it, it's like, man, what does it mean to you, to each one of you to cross that bridge? And is it still relevant towards the challenges that we face as a nation? and as a world. So I'm going to put this question in the chat. What does it mean um, to, to go across that bridge? And I think last time we started with Denisha, so Jakai, you're going to start us off whenever you're ready. So um, thank you. Uh, yeah, it's a pretty, it's a pretty heavy quote. Um, I think for me, I think going across that bridge or across that bridge means basically, I think, overcoming challenges and adversity. Um, I think this is still relevant because as as black people, um, we are still fighting the good fight. Um, I think that fight has evolved. But you could also say it's been it's been a fight that we're still fighting, which is to exercise our humanity to the world, our communities and ourselves. Um, and that goes for all groups that have been historically marginalized. Um, but we're still having we're still having to get across a bridge that can't support us. Um, and there are people actively trying their best so that we can't see the other side of this bridge. And especially 
to make sure that we can't even get across it at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And we can see that too in the book when he had to cross um, that bridge when they, they had the march and they were crossing all the way over to Selma. The amount of like courage it must have taken and all that energy to be able to, to go across. So definitely some great points. There's a, a, lot, of, a lot of barriers. <laughs> um, Denisha, would you like to go next? When I think of across that bridge, I think of, you know, in the Pocahontas movie when she was just like, just across the river bend, like there's just so much more to what she just used to. And that's that's what I think of because like, it's like, it's just, when you really think about it, it's just, it's just across the bridge. Like you really have to think like, whatever that you probably want or desire is right across that bridge and you need to like go and like, take that step, take that mileage, that like, you just need to go to your end goal right there. And then when you see what is across from that bridge, you can always go back to where you started. It won't be the same because you just experienced what happened on the other side. But now you're going back, you get to take other people with you to bring them across that bridge as well. So that's what I really think it is. It's like, through every type of like political movement, any type of protest, it always takes that one person who saw across that bridge and now it's time for them to go back and educate people, be like, hey, this is what I seen on the other side and we can get to the other side. I just need your help to get there because I I can't do this by myself. I saw it by myself, but I need the, I need everybody to see what is on this other side. So that's why I think across the bridges is like at first it's just your personal goal then it's it's time for you to spread that wisdom and spread that goal yourself Mm -hmm. absolutely thanks so much for sharing especially with that metaphor of like really crossing that bridge what does it mean to you versus like when you go together um so thank you so much for sharing um adriana you're you're up Yes, I think when I think about across, like what across that bridge means to me, I think there's this quote he says, children growing, one second, children growing up under inhumane conditions are not carefree. They sense that something is wrong and embark on an inner search to explain so much that is not keeping with their hearts. And I think it really speaks to, especially like being like, as when I think about like my life, like as a black woman, right? And like, this is certain sensibilities that you have, like growing up, like being a black woman. I think when you first, I, like as a kid, when you're a child, when you first like realize that you're black, right? You're socialized and racialized into being black. And then I think about like my personal experience when my mom, uh, when I was in like elementary school, she had got breast cancer. And they had said like the cause of her breast cancer was stress, right? And we're like stress, like, what does that mean? Like how, and then as I've like gotten older, I've like go, go, went to school, it's kind of been like my, Look, like when he talks about like something just doesn't sit right with you like you, there's a sense like you don't know exactly what it is you don't necessarily have like the building blocks to understand like how this comes to this but there's something that just doesn't like feel right and as you like grow and get older you try to search for ways to understand what that is and that's something I talk about, about with my friends like once you gain the terminology terminology and like language to indict like certain systems and structures like identifying like oh, this system is structurally violent in this way, da, da, da. Like this system causes us to um, be exposed to an undue amount of stress or uh, to, to an undue amount of toxins, which shapes the way that we navigate in the world. It shapes like our biological composition, right? It changes because of epigenetics, because the way these systems are structured and set up. And therefore it can bore out these outcomes. And once you start to have that language to like, not only like sense what is happening around you, but also like, indict the system and take, do the be able to do the work to like be like oh but this is how we can this is how it's harming us and this is how we can change it I feel like that is really what gets like those are like the bridges that you cross as you grow up right like I think about when I first learned that like racism and social construction or I think when I first learned about different bits and pieces of like our history as you begin to like piece those together and piece together like the world that you live in and understand how and why it affects you the way it does I feel like those are like all the little bridges that you cross that like once you like as Anisha was saying once you see it you just like can't unsee it anymore right it's forever like in your filter of how you view and like understand the world and I feel like as a collective, like he talks about um, at the end, he talks about magnifying, actualizing and and incarnating the beauty of our own flames. Like I think all of us are doing that journey, like that internal work 
can do like it never ends because you're always learning but like that continuous work to like feed our flames right and the hope is that like we each spark this like spark our own flames and as they get bigger they spark flames for somebody else to like identify within them like what is happening and hopefully we can all begin to cross the collective bridge you know what I mean towards mm. change but yeah Absolutely. Thanks so much for sharing. Yeah, a lot of a lot of great points there, especially like what came to my mind is accessibility over time, like you access information and you access some of these tools that he's talking about over time. Like if I were to read this book like five years ago or 10 years ago, I know it wasn't out, but like if he had come out with this book sooner or if he'd come out with certain parts of it, then I think it, it would hit me differently because I would have a different understanding of who I am and what the world is but like again like kind of reading this with who we are and who I am now it's just like wow it's like I feel privileged and grateful to have the tools to comprehend this message and thinking about how we collectively I know all of you are talking about that collectivism of like we all need to cross that bridge like we might have crossed the bridge because we're, we're already having a conversation about it but maybe my goal is to have some of these students or to have some of these community members or faith leaders or politicians or people who are around us like they need to come and cross this bridge with us so we can all like continue to learn and grow um, from one another. So I think that I know personally that's why it's still relevant today because it's just a constant challenge of like who can cross the bridge who's allowed to cross the bridge. I know it's like such a such a metaphor but like who's who like who has a gate in front of the bridge who has a key where like oh you have to like keep stopping on the bridge because you can't get there all the way and what does that look and feel like you know so again just like so many <laughs> different ways to um take the bridge metaphor but ultimately it is a journey that each one of us is on but we're also in um together Oh, right. Excellent, Mar um, Marsha. And who built the bridge in the first place? Like, who's the bridge really for? Because it's like, because <laughs> in our in our world, too, sometimes we have to take down bridges. I think it was in um, when I go visit family down in the Baltimore, Maryland area, they're redoing a bridge in Washington, D.C. because they realized, oh, it's unstable to cross. So they're like redoing it. But like, who is it for? Because I've been driving that bridge like for a long time and now it's seen as unstable like some of the challenges we come across the way um so again a lot of a lot of different intricacies of who built the bridge who is it for and who's allowed um to cross right um so our next question really has to um get with or, or kind of go along the lines of like some of the lessons that we've learned because when we cross that bridge I know Denise you're talking about how like when you when you cross that bridge you get you get to understand things better and I know Adrian you're saying oh well you can't unsee it once you've seen it right so now that we are in a sense we've a, we've crossed a bridge together whether it's in conversation or action what um, are some of the lessons that we've learned from John Lewis and how can we really apply it in our own lives because again like just such incredible knowledge that he has shared with us but now how can we transform that into an actionable piece to say um so i'll put this question in the chat for everyone um thinking about how can we take those lessons that we've learned and apply it using action so i'll give you a minute to think about it i know just like loaded questions <laughs> to really think about um everything in the book and then i'll let you, all the panelists you can choose who wants to go first this time i've been just like picking you as we go <laughs> but if anyone is jumping up for for joy for one of these <laughs> i guess i could go first um so how do we take lessons learned from to apply to our own lives? I think, I think we start with like truth telling and like one thing that he always says that I like truly enjoy is like we get into good trouble, we get into necessary trouble. But we also have to like speak up and speak out. Like when we identify like injustice happening, it's important to act like act upon changing like that either macro or micro situation, right? Like think about like in our interpersonal relationships, if you see injustice is happening, if you see um, microaggressions happening, if you see that like the dynamics of the situation are racist, it's 
up to us, all of us, like not just black and brown people, but all of us to do the work of like calling that out, acknowledging it and doing the work to like um, repair that situation, whatever that repair, whatever repair means. Right. And I think once you get past like that point of, and then on the macro level, like laws, policies, and those things that affect us. And I think once you get past like the truth telling, it just goes into like remembering that this is a continuous act. Like you can never truly stop. You have to always be like acting upon identifying systems and structures and how that you are incorporating this world, right? Like how do you navigate this world? How are you affecting other people? Because we live in a like we live and live in a collective. Like we all, whether we want to or not, affect each other and the way that we navigate. And I think once we get to that point, I think that social change will begin to meet the political, right? Like you will start to see, like, once people socially begin to like acknowledge and recognize individual people's humanity and just have the like the respect of just honoring their humanity, we can begin to get to a place where like naturally policies will change because people identify like what is happening currently is not just, right? And I think that's when we start to see this shift um, for sure. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And I just want to highlight that point of like the social impacting the political, because I know like, especially as a teacher, like trying to teach people these like social elements, whether it's like, well, this is what an action plan looks like. Well, this is what it means to comprehend like a passage or to understand like, okay, right, when you're reading it, do you understand what you're reading? Or even with social emotional learning being like, okay, like what, how, how do our emotions kind of play into it? So like, just all of that interlay um, for sure. So thanks so much for sharing, Adriana. Um, Denisha or Jakai, you want to, if you want to go first? I can go next. So one thing that I would have to take is to really like, I remember in one, one of the books that he, one of his autobiographies, um, not autobiography, but one of his biographies, um, he said that no matter what, you always have to listen and not just listen, but listen to understand what the person is coming from. Because when you talk to somebody and you guys are in an argument and they're just denying everything you say, and then that means that that compels you to deny everything that they're saying. You don't want to listen for like continue this anymore. You're just going to stick to your own like beliefs now. But he like he says once you break down that barrier even though you feel like the person is totally in the wrong if you break down that barrier and try to understand why are why do you think this way why 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 do you think this how did this happen do you grow up thinking this way did you did you do something did something happen to you to think this way once you break that you break down that shell that angry wall that that person has about that topic and then you open them and then now you understand more like oh this is why pe this group of people think this way because this is happening to them. And so now I need to figure out a way how to show them I understand their views and how to show them that, oh, maybe we can like mix our views together and come up with a better plan or how you know, your view is coming from a very emotional state, but it's, but it's not, you're not making the wrong choice. You're making the best choice for yourself, but in the moment it's not the right choice for everybody in the world, not everybody in the world, but everybody as a community. So it's really just like, you really need to take that one step and really get to know that other person. Cause like everybody has a different story with you, no matter if you're the same demogra demographic, um, the opposite demographic, every person that you meet has a different story and every single person has a different encounter with what you had to do. Some people, cry getting a D in the class. Some people are like, fine, like, okay, I get a D, I didn't fail. But then some people like, dang, I have a D, now I'm gonna need to work harder. Like everybody has a different reaction to different things. So now you need to understand why they have that reaction. Cause it doesn't, it doesn't like, it doesn't just like help them, but it helps you because it strengthened your point of view and also opens your mind to something else because what the world need is everybody to have an open mind. If you don't have an open mind, there's never going to be change. So that's what I would have to say, like a lesson that I learned, like always just keep an open mind and always like try to like ask why instead of like say no. Mm, yes, absolutely. So thinking about those relationships, I know that what came to my mind and I think also Adriana as well, you were messaging me as well. It's kind of like how our relationships 
um, uh, for formed across things that are similar and different. And they can either connect us and really deepen our understanding of each other, or we might just need to form relationships with people who are different from us in order to get those experiences and 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 really have that open mind because it's really what those differences is it's facing that adversity i know um john Luce talks about it in one of his sections about like what does it mean to face adversity and how can we use that as leverage for action or or actionable things in the future so um absolutely thanks you so much for sharing denisha and jakai go on ahead thank you um <clears throat> Uh, I really enjoy, I think one of my favorite parts about reading this book is actually when John Lewis is talking about basically just like, just this idea of faith and faith in general as a concept. And to give context, I really don't have like the strongest relationship when it comes to like faith as a concept, but I think reading it, it made me realize, it gave me like a lot of perspective. Like <clears throat> there's this quote that I really like that he said where he goes, once you realize your own true divinity, no one can imprison you, reject you, abuse you, or degrade you. And any attempt to do so will only be an aid to your own liberation. Um, and so I think I really like that quote because I, I feel like throughout this whole book, John Lewis kind of talks about life almost like in a cycle. So it's like he never, <clears throat> he never necessarily says that, um, he never says that we should never have like things like challenges or adversity. Um, I think he actually um, sort of encourages it. Um, and he goes to say that basically going through those types of trials and tribulations only improve your character. Um, <clears throat> but essentially like what he's trying to say in this quote or how I interpret it is that just by being you, you already kind of have everything you have. And of course we all need like, you know, community, but I just love how he also enforces this idea um that by believing in yourself and having faith you could pretty much do anything you set your mind to um and no one can like break your spirit um of course all easier said than done um because i think when you sort of like are a part of a marginalized group or you are you come in a black or brown vessel um you're actively told that you know you're the opposite of these things that you're not divine that you're actually like second class citizen right but after reading this it made me really realize that um that like everyone sort of like is divine by just being who they are as a person as a human being as a individual in this world um yeah so i, I think that was just really like um it felt really liberating and it was really enlightening to just kind of hear that in his thoughts about faith mm -hmm. absolutely i i definitely agree thanks so much for sharing especially like with faith the way that like he talks about faith and, and religion and all these different interconnections like really gives like an internal perspective on how faith can be an actionable item or how it can be really at the core of um, some of these movements. So um, thank you so much for sharing because it's definitely like a powerful point into staying for who each and every one of us are. Um, so now we're going to take a, a brief like audience question and answer um, time before I get to our final question or two. So if any audience members or even panelists have any questions or comments they'd like to add, um, feel free to do so. Deborah. Um, there was another lesson that I thought that can be taken from this book. Um, and that is that when one gets to the point where we think we're ready to be engaged, we need to think about the risks that we're willing to take and the lengths to which we're willing to go before we engage because out on the battlefield, it's too late to decide, well, I'm with this group of people who are committed to nonviolence. Um, I can't hold to that. You, you, you can't do that to the people that you're with. You need, to, you need to work in tandem with whatever group you are connected to, and you need that plan beforehand. Um, and I don't, I should know this, but I don't remember the name of the two civil rights groups that he mentioned where um, there was a split. There was a split from one group when some people said, you know, we need to do this nonviolently um, and other people didn't feel the same way. And so they actually didn't stay together because they knew they were gonna interfere with each other's methods, if you will. But it's that pre-planning, it's that thinking about a problem before 
before it's at your door and what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a part of that study for sure. So thank you so much for sharing, Deborah. Wendy, go ahead. I just want to comment on what Deborah had said. That's an excellent point. And John Lewis had talked about after they crossed the bridge uh, at in Selma, he talked about some of the people marching with him had gone through a training school on how to be nonviolent and how important that training school and philosophy was. And it was south of Nashville. And I can't recall the name of the school, um, but it was started um, by a professor down there. And I'll, I'll find out who that was. But I don't know if they actually have training schools like that now for people to go through so that they can learn um, no matter what obstacle faces them on that bridge, no matter what they come across, no matter what anger that they're feeling at that moment when they're being hit or beaten or whatever, dehumanized, yeah. how they can maintain that conviction to nonviolence. It just would be a really great thing to have that education again. Um, but thank you, Deborah, for putting that out. And I just wanted to ask some of the panelists, have you ever felt, um, have you ever experienced something that you were, were so dehumanized or rejected or um, in such a bad way, but you were able to take this learning environment from John Lewis and, and overcome that? Have you ever had a personal experience like that where you, could, you were challenged? Could you share with us? Thanks. Um, I guess I can go on that one. I think, I think, well, I, I want to start with this. I think something like important that John Lewis said is that he's, that he said in the C-SPAN speech, he talked about how it's important to disturb, disturb the order of things. Um, and I think the way that takes shape doesn't necessarily, doesn't have to be one way. I want to start with that. And I think um, a moment in time where that may have happened for me. This is one distinct um, experience I could think of. It's when I transferred to UConn. I was about three semesters in. Um, and I think just pointing out that I transferred, I was a junior. At that time, it was pre-med. If anybody knows like the pre-med environment, it can be pretty toxic environment just to begin with. But also like going to this campus was like a large culture shock when I was like grew up in a very diverse environment. And then going there where it was um, the opposite of that, especially being pre-med was a culture shock, but also I went through like three, four semesters without having like one black teacher like ever, like at all. Um, and then I finally had a women's reproductions class. It was my first black teacher, my first black female teacher, like women teacher that I had. Um, so off of that, I was ex very excited and it was a politics and reproduction class for women. So I was excited and there was this one student in the class, right? Every he would he would make like he would make it his job just to be inherently disrespectful like every day like he would listen to his music very loud in class like while she's talking she would like get up like five minutes early every time and like stomp to the door he would act like very like sarcastic like um, adversarial questions and. I always like made it my like notion to like disturb that, like to answer the like answer the question to try to support her in any ways I could. But it got to the point where like that wasn't just enough, right? So there was one day that I had to like tell him like that is not okay. Like this is not what we're gonna do in this class. Um, you're gonna have some respect. You like acknowledge that, and also calling out like the it was clear it bothered everybody in the class, but nobody was taking it upon themselves to do anything. And I feel like the only reason like in any other instance. That wouldn't I probably wouldn't have waited as long as I did, but I feel like being in that new like me being new to that space in general and already feeling like that space didn't necessarily like you kind of select like the campus itself or like the programs that are and didn't necessarily like hold space for me like was the only reason why I feel like I may wait longer than I usually do. But I was like, we're not going to do this. Like, this is not OK. You're very disrespectful. This is the first Black female teacher we have. She's discussing topics that we're talking about reproduction and how it relate to Black women. Um, was oppression and I said we're not gonna do this and he also was trying to be disrespectful teacher I said every day you come in here you're disrespectful you listen to your music and you don't like um and just blatantly just rude 
to our teacher and it's annoying and it, it needs to stop. So what we're not gonna, what you're gonna do is you're gonna turn around, listen to what the teacher has to say and stop being disrespectful. And after that, we the teacher was like, you know, I've been trying to report him. And she was like, would you report him to the um, office for me? I was like, yes, we can do that. And everybody else in the class was like, we all agree and the other girl pinched in. We're like, we so agree with you. I'm like, where was all this energy beforehand? Like, like we all, like, and we all felt this way. Like we have the power to change this. But once that happened, he did not, there was not a peep out of him for the rest of the semester. He was good as pie. But I think it just speaks to like being willing to disturb the order and like acknowledge your power in situations where you feel like you may not necessarily like have that power like more likely than not you're not the only person that feels that way um and it just takes like one person to be like no we're not going to do this anymore for like the the waterfall effect to happen if that makes sense but yeah mm -hmm. absolutely that bystander intervention so so in important um and i also typed out your question wendy i tried to like paraphrase and, and so I put it in the chat. I tried to get it as much as I could. So while you're talking, I typed it in the chat here. So if you've, if anyone, panelists or audience members, if you'd like to share, um, go for it. Have you ever experienced something so dehumanizing, but you were able to take it as a learning opportunity? Um, um, uh, this dehumanizing thing never really happened personally to me, but I did take it into effect is when um, University of Hartford, um, they had um, this kind of debacle with these two roommates, these two girls. Um, one was a black girl and the other one was a white girl. And um, um, she did so much dehumanizing things like, um, shoving her toothbrush and like not very hygienic places, calling her names, calling her mean words and everything. And it really, I me, mean, I think I learned about this when I was probably like a junior or senior. It really made me scared to go to college. <laughs> I was like, um, especially in the random roommate selection as a freshman, like I would be like totally scared for my life. Like, oh my goodness, like, I don't want this to happen. I already heard like, you know, the classic bad roommate stories from like my siblings or my older friends went to call like, yeah, I have a roommate who's not so clean, but like there's a roommate who actually just like, like just who treats you like literal like garbage and everything. And what I took that as a learning opportunity is that like, um, I read up more about her, you know, went through social media, um, since I live right next to the University of Hartford, I know people who go there. There's some people who know her, some people who are like acquaintances of her. And well, I just, it made me learn like she, like her family also come from that belief system. So like, it makes me really think about the whole open-minded thing. It was just like, like it's her actions are completely a hundred, a hundred and ten percent wrong, but like the environment that she grew up in, that she grew up in, wasn't the best environment to really do that. So you really think of it as kids, like you're really like a, kids are really like a sponge. They soak up everything that their parents are seeing in front of them, everything from their environment. Another thing, technology, they're like soaking up everything that's like right there. You have the few kids who are sponges that kind of like squeeze out the bad stuff would be like, oh, mom, I heard you say this bad thing. That's really bad. You're not supposed to say that at all. And then you have the kids who just like, just be quiet and be like, well, this is my mom. My mom always tells me the right things to do or not. So if she thinks this is right, then this is right. So that, I take that as a huge like opportunity to be like, well, now we need, now like, it's all about the younger kids now. like. I like um, some people, like I remember a couple years ago in high school, they was just like, when you're an adult, it's hard to change an adult's mind. It's, it's totally hard. Like it, it's good. It's, it's going to take them a real like kind of like rock bottom for them to understand like, oh, like their mindset. It's like, it's like, it's not in the right place, but like we can always start with the kids. And that's why I think, especially elementary education and middle school education is really important. And that's, 
why I be- that's why I believe instead of like punishing kids, you need to teach them like what you're saying is wrong. Don't punish them because it's wrong because then you're gonna lead them to like, well, I'm gonna get punished at, at the end of the day anyway. So like now like you you just need to like teach them so we can like stop so we don't have to have kids worried about all that. I'd rather worry about a stinky roommate than a roommate that would do all these horrible things to me. So that's why I would say like the most dehumanizing thing. When I read that article and I I was just really appalled. I was like, like this, this is not what, what you want to hear at all happen to somebody. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that, Denisha, especially with like, when you're talking about teaching kids, I know I was like, an elementary school teacher, we, we've been like really changing up the ball game and teaching them because now like a part of the curriculum, which that's a whole other event and conversation on education and teaching social justice things. <laughs> but but when we teach the kids now, it's a lot of like, do you need to reset or like reset your mind and really have an internal reflective moment. So we teach them, oh, this is how you cope with it. You're not in trouble. Why don't you go collect yourself and then come back to the space or teaching them explicit tools of like, this is how, this is what you can do or some options for when you're angry or for when you're sad, or how do you share happiness in a way that is safe, right? So like teaching those like tools explicitly. And that really, again, goes back to John Lewis's point on like, this is a part of that study, peace and love is like teaching them alternatives. So like, like you said, Denisha, it's not like, oh, I'm punishing you for this, but instead we're taking it, like you said, Wendy, as a learning opportunity. So really like really frame, reframing the whole thing or reframing how we get that bridge. So thank you so much for sharing, Denisha. Uh, Jakai, did you want to answer the question? Totally up to you. Yeah, um, I'll take a stab at it. Um, I feel like, <clears throat> uh, I guess when it comes to dehumanizing things, I mean, I think dehumanizing things happen to me more than I would like, but I also, I'm Black and I'm, I'm living here in America, so I'm a little bit on guard when it comes to those things. Uh, one example is, I remember when I was an undergrad, we actually had we had a blackface incident and it was uh, someone who was on like a, a sports team at our school. And there was a lot of like commotion when it first happened. Um, but the person who I did, it wasn't really, um, I don't think they were really taking any accountability. They didn't really realize why it was wrong. And I don't think they were in a position when, where the, that they wanted to hear why it was wrong, right? So what I kind of learned and took away from that is that um, people who are in privileged positions don't always take accountability. Um, and I think that I think that's because a lot of people who have privilege um, and are made known that they have privilege, it's almost seen as being like, villainize you know and I like I feel like it's not really the same thing they're not synonymous privilege is right just something that you're just kind of granted um that because of maybe some which you identify with or a or how people perceive you right and I think one thing that I'm also learning is that due to your do your positionality right which you may look like um or even just identities that you hold right your certain things are going to be different for you certain things that you do are going to have different weight in comparison to other people who are probably more marginalized right um and i don't think everyone kind of understands that and i think also that's something i'm also learning too you know i think like kind of john lewis was saying like it's a con- it's continuous work you know you're always always something that has to be revealed or um maybe it's something that you're not really getting the first time or the second time um, so uh, I've kind of learned, I've kind of taken that experience, right, and I've learned to that other people aren't able or aren't willing to always accountability in times when they're causing harm, but also that has me also learn to also strive to make sure I'm also, you know, taking accountability if I'm ever abusing any one of my privileges or I'm, you know, or I'm just maybe saying something ignorant, you know? Um, So I think that's really important just as a humanity thing, always striving to be able to take accountability and always be willing to, or not be afraid to be like, yeah, I'm in the wrong for this, you know? So 
Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thanks so much for sharing, Jakai. Especially like it's like okay to make mistakes, but then like like you said, how do we have accountability and then take that lesson and move forward with it instead of being like, oh no, like uh, like now that I've made a mistake, I can't ever do like action again or I can't ever do this again, right? And a lot of that is about perception, is like that internal perception and then how other people see you. So like that perception of privilege versus like the reality of it. And it's just like such an interesting concept to see how like um, some people, when they they maybe look at me, they're like, oh, well, like you're white. And then others are like, well, no, you're you're Hispanic or you're Middle Eastern or this or that. And like that's perception of certain privileges on race or you might have a privilege on like gender or on education or there's all these different privileges that come at an intersection an intersection and then it's like what do we do with that how do we now support each other and hold each other accountable for the privileges that we do or or don't have right because privilege can be used as a tool that can help more people across a bridge or it can be used to blow it up essentially <laughs> like right so like who built that bridge and who is it for how are we using these different tools right um so thank you everyone for answering that question and thank you wendy it's an excellent question on um what we can um do and then we're going to get into our final one or semi-final one depending on if um other some of y'all have some um other questions oh thanks thanks charlie i know you gotta go thanks for coming um so one of our um semi-final questions is how can we um help others across that bridge because i know we're really getting deep into the metaphor of like okay we're gonna cross it but like now now in the words of john lewis like how are we gonna do it like, how, like what does that look like to to bring other people with us so I'm gonna pose this to panelists and then everyone else, if you'd love to jump in, um, go on ahead. How can we help others across that bridge? Um, I know how we can help people cross the bridge by like giving them time. Everything truly takes time. You don't wanna rush to rush somebody to an idea. Um, some people are afraid of heights, so if you, for some reason, have to stop on the bridge and they look down, they're going to have to, have to want to jump out the car and, like, run back to where they know they originated from. So um, that's what I have to say. I'm like, give people time. It takes people a while to, like, really, like, know what they want and really want to know, like, do, do they really want it and do they really want to accomplish it in that time that you want them to accomplish it? So I would just say, um, just really like, just get people, really talk to them and be like, here, like this, let's get to the other side of the bridge. I seen this vision, you can reach it. I just need you guys to come along. And then further along, you can always get other people who help you cross that bridge, go back and get other people as well. Because all you just need is just that one person. I probably cannot connect to that one person who can't cross than their friend. So if I can get their friend to cross and their friend can come back and get their own friend, that's, that's me winning by association. So it's just really time, time and process. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I love that metaphor that you shared, Denisha, about like sometimes it just, it just takes time or like coming back to that same person, like some of the people I went to high school with, like at Windsor High, like I couldn't reach them in high school. But then maybe in college or maybe now as adults, I've seen them come to these events. I've seen them in the community and they're like, oh, my gosh, like now I'm ready. Can you walk with me? Right. So uh, it's that that kind of time differentiation truly makes a difference. So thank you for sharing that, Denisha. Adriana or Jakai, go ahead, Adriana. Yeah, going off of like what Nisha said, and even like some points that were made earlier, I think it's like um, the willingness to engage with people that may not necessarily be like in line or lockstep with like your viewpoints and like identifying that like your similarities is like what brings you together, but like your differences are what keep you there. And a lot of times your differences are your virtues, right? Like your differences are what make you unique, but also help shape your viewpoint and like the how you experience and navigate the world and I think it also brings you into like what are why are these your differences right and you start to investigate like how and why these are differences 
and you start to find like a through line like okay these may like these may be our differences but at, at its core we're battling the same or similar struggles right and once you get there you're able to like find that like that common ground again through those differences I think that's when you're able to like get across a bridge and like Denise has said so eloquently like you may not be able to get like the one person to do it but you're may you, you're able to spark somebody's mind to get across that bridge and once you're able to get somebody else there's like it's like the rock that hits the pond and like all the ripples like it's giving that energy but um like it definitely is all about just like being willing to engage with people that may not necessarily be like um in line with you but just having the faith that like having truthful honest discussions is going to bring you to some type of like crossroads Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Seeking out other people who might have different opinions or who might be just completely different from you. I know as a mixed person, I might just talk to anyone who's not mixed or to people who are black and who are white and all these different races. And that could be my own form of action. But then like when we try to get more people across that bridge, it's like it's challenging ourselves. Right. And because we're all at different places, the way I might challenge someone to like come across this bridge or wait for them might be different than how Adriana and Denisha would do that, how you how you all would um, bring someone across. So it's really leaning into our strengths and understanding where we can bolster um, some of the things that we have to work on for sure. And Jakai, go ahead. Yeah, my point is pretty similar um, to both uh, yours, Casella's and, and Adriana's. Um, I think it's about definitely challenging people, but also listening, right? So <clears throat> offering me, offering somebody um, maybe some sort of insight, wisdom, education on just something uh, that can help them sort of like cross the bridge. Uh, I know what I try to do is I definitely am intentional about listening to people who don't share the same identities as me, who have different life experiences as me, because um, I think it just makes me a more well-rounded person, um, but it also allows me to also look at the world more like uh, as well as as more well-rounded um, just because there are like I said different people having different life experiences that I would probably not even think that they have right or um, or never would even yeah think about if someone didn't share their um, their experience or any sort of uh, wisdom that they had um, so I think simultaneously you can be definitely bringing people you know uh across that bridge with you but i think also i think i think also crossing the bridge is very communal anyway i think we can bring people but we also have to be brought as well you know i think um just because right there's always a perspective that's missing and there's always insight or something that we can learn more about you know um again like just sort of like that life work being just super continuous so um yeah. Awesome. Thanks so much for sharing, Jakai. All right. Before I um, pose to our final thoughts question, does any other audience members have um, questions or comments they would like to share before we get to our final share up? Go ahead, Wendy. I just think that what John Lewis said about taking time to listen, really listen um, and have patience. I think that's really what it's all about and sharing in a safe place so we can all cross that bridge communally. So thank you, everyone. Mm, absolutely. Go ahead, Deborah. Um, one other thing that I'm actually working on with a friend, a good friend who disagrees with me on a very, um, on a topic that's of, of great importance to me. Um, I think that we can try to get people to rewrite a story, something, a situation that we disagree with or about, we can ask them to rewrite their story from someone else's point of view, ask them to put themselves in somebody else's shoes and then decide how they would react or what they would do or what steps they would take. It's not, it's not easy. It's very slow going, but it's something that I'm working on. Well, what would you do if you were in this situation? You know, if somebody if somebody came to you tomorrow and said, you know, sorry, but you're not going to be able to vote this time, would you fluff it off and say, oh, that's somebody else's problem? I don't have time to think about it. My vote, my voting is is safe. Or would you really try to figure out what it would feel like to be told that, and then decide 
the best reaction. So. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Using that empathetic listening of like, wow, what would it be like? Because when he was sharing um, John Lewis about his experiences, I was just think, sitting here thinking like, I can't even like imagine what it must have been like to to like live through what he lived through. And yet he was like, nope, I'm going to share this. I'm we're going to do this because we need to build empathy so we can have better action so that it's not just, oh man, like I know that I, I want to change this, but hopefully it'll change. It's holding on to that. And then finding more people along the way and really having that spirit to say like, nope, I know that it's going to be tough, but we're going to do it together. So thank you so much for sharing, Deborah. Any other final thoughts? Go ahead, Marcia. Um, I just wanted to tag on a little bit. I, I love what Adriana did in that class. And I think that's one of the things that he would say we should do. It's difficult. It's hard to know when it's going to make things better to speak out and when it's going to make things worse. So it's, all, it's not ever really easy. But I think the other piece of it is to live the way we believe so that in whatever interactions we have, and it's a challenge. I mean, I can think of a few particular people that have been head of our country that I would have a hard time doing this with, but I think we have to, we have to live it. And I think his point that if you don't lower yourself to the methods of the person you're opposing, and you model and live what you believe of love and connection, then we're actually being a wall that the person can't get beyond. And so they'd have to back up and it's either gonna go back and hit them in the nose and then they're gonna have to think about it or maybe they're not ready to change. But I think it's a combination of trying to live it with all of our interactions and it's hard, I can tell you, I've lived a long time and doing what Adriana did and, and, and Denisha and Jakai. I mean, when you encounter something or when we encounter something, don't let it go by, but let it you know, speak out with the way we believe, which is with love. So thank you all very much. I, I really appreciate what you've been saying. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing, Marsha. I know that it's really meeting people with where they're at, right? You can't like force them into the things you can't like, especially to like when, when I, whenever I educate like kids or adults or figure skaters or anyone, it's just kind of like, okay, like I got to meet you where you're at and I can guide you across the bridge or guide you to this water or this new skill, but I can't force you to get to that. So it's, it's kind of having the tools that John Lewis has provided of love and peace and reconciliation and preparation, and then taking that in, into an actionable form so that we can better service one another collectively. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that, everyone. Um, I know we've gotten through most of our program pretty quick, so we might be able to end um, a little early if that's all right with y'all. Um, so our final kind of question is what are what are some of the main takeaways that you've had from this discussion? Um, so I'm gonna just kind of do a round table for anyone who'd like to share panelists or um, audience members. What are some key takeaways that you're gonna take back into your community? I'll type in the chat too. <laughs> Here we go. And while some of y'all are thinking, I guess I'll go first. Um, some of the key takeaways is that um, sometimes I always want to, to do more, but the power of listening and not just um, listening to respond, but listening empathetically is something that can be done internally and externally. So I know something that I'm gonna take away is I'm gonna just continue to work on that and um, just meet my students where they're at and, and know that I can give myself grace and just try the best because we live in a crazy time, crazy world. And just, you know, I, I am enough as I am and I'm gonna just do what I can to the best of my ability. And a part of that is gonna be with empathetic listening.
Um, I can go next. I think first I want to thank Cassie for like curating the space and like just creating this environment where we could talk about this. I think like just having these discussions has been very like reaffirming. I don't know if you guys can hear that, but anyway, um, and they, they keep going. I'm gonna pause because there's like the <laughs> it's okay, no worries. Life happens, we just kind of take it as it comes. <laughs> Um, I can go. Um, I think like kind of honestly what um, definitely I'll take back just this the concept and just the action of uh, sort of like being the change that we actually want to seek um, from other people, our nation. You know, I think definitely what John Lewis was really just alluding to was really the power of self and just the, just being an example, right, can be pretty contagious. People will see you, they might see qualities about you that they also might want to implement their own character. And, you know, it just starts a sort of a, a chain reaction as well. Um, before we know it, we all are, you know, uh, just, uh, what would I say it? well-rounded like just human beings um so I think that's something I really want to take back with me just I mean I guess continue just to continue just being the change I want to see from others um and to sort of enact um a good example mm -hmm. absolutely thanks so much for sharing Jakai Adriana do you want to come on back <laughs> I know you had to <laughs> sure um I think for me I think the importance of like identifying your power and understanding like it's similar to the quote that um, Jakai had said earlier what he just said like the importance of understanding like sometimes being yourself is radical enough and just like existing as who you are every day and just like continuously like having that grind to like believe in faith and believe that like we can make this better and the collective power of all of us but also just the power that you hold um and the changes that you can make every day in every aspect of your life I think who I'll take away. Excellent. Thanks so much, Adriana. Denise, would you like to share? Yeah. Um, my key takeaway is your response. It's more how you respond to things. Cause especially like um, especially if it's about a matter that you care about and somebody says something a little backhanded, like your response time is really quick, like, hey, hey don't say that or it's that. But it's just like your response can also be like, yeah, I got this person like riled up, like, oh, I got them, I got them mad. Like now, now what I'm saying to them is my over exaggerated emotion to that response. So it's just like some people are gonna take that to, into um, precaution. So, and also, uh, also time. I feel like time is one of the most in, important, important one time and response, especially um, me. I come from two immigrant parents. Um, out of like a lot of my siblings, um, me and my sister were the only ones born here in America. So we were the only two out of like seven to go through a full American education system. So I, we, we both have a more progressive and kind of modern mind. So like, I, I like, I support like a lot of groups that are like politically going out protesting for their rights. And, you know, some, some of my family members are like, Hey, I don't know, but I'm like, I'm not gonna argue with them. I'm like, I can understand why you think this way because it was more like in your culture, you need to shut up about these things and like, you're not supposed to speak on these things. So I'm just like, take your time. I'm not gonna argue with you because I know no matter what, we're always gonna like hit that like block right there. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna have you take, take your time with like knowing the stuff because in your mind, you know everybody should like have rights, but right now it's taking you a while to get there. And I'm like, I'm not gonna have an angry response when you say something. I'm just gonna just say like, hey, that's not right, but you know, just 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 keep just keep going. We're we're gonna get there one day. We're gonna get there one day. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Denisha. Yeah, it's having that faith. Like someday, like he was talking about that in the book. It's just like, no, nope, we're gonna get there. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much for all my panelists for sharing. Um, and then anyone in the audience, if you'd also like to share some key takeaways, um, I'll open the floor to anyone who'd like to share key takeaways from our discussion. 
um, that you're going to bring back. Go ahead, Wendy. Thank you. Um, I just uh, think from what everyone had said, you have to go beyond what you learned in your education system that you grew up with, what you learned in your own family environment, in your own small town. And you have to look to those people who are challenging those beliefs and uh, listen to them and try and learn from different perspectives and move forward to cross that bridge, I think. That's probably my takeaway today and have courage just to keep educating yourself. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thanks so much for sharing, Wendy. Any other audience members want to share? Totally up to you. Go ahead, Marcia. Yeah, I, I, I just, part of my takeaway is you all because I have had to think so often in the last number of years about not getting lost in a sea of despair, as John Lewis cautions us. And when I listen to people like you that are fighting this battle, the next generation's down, and it gives me hope that uh, we can still keep moving forward and be that, uh, that community that we should be. So thank you very much, all of you. And thanks for your program, Cassie. Absolutely, thanks so much for coming too. Any other final thoughts that folks wanna share? No, that's all right, excellent. So thank you so much. I just wanna thank um, on the behalf of the Windsor Human Relations Commission, thank you so much to all our panelists, um, to Jakai, Denisha and Adriana, thank you so much, I hope we, all had a, an enriching conversation to meet one another where we're at with all of our collective knowledge and to take these action steps forward. Um, and speaking of action steps, um, I have some helpful resources. So I'm gonna share my screen one more time. And um, a part of our helpful resources, I have some listed, it's not, a, not exhaustive because <laughs> the internet is so full of everything I wanna say. <laughs> So here are, um, here's a, just a brief top three list of helpful resources, um, articles and different um, nonprofit organizations that have continued the legacy in the work of John Lewis. Um, there is a, a lot coming up on voting rights since um, even in the book he was talking about how um, Roe v. Wade is trying to be overturned again. So there's a lot of different ways that we ourselves can participate. Um, in, in taking actionable steps. And finally, um, action can come in many forms. I know that the internet and technology, social media is definitely um, one of the ways that we can, um, or one of the tools I should say that we can use to take action. But there, there's a bunch of other ways as well. This is not um, an exhaustive list, um, but just some of the things that we can do, like having a conversation, like these events, or going to virtual volunteering or, or attending protests or, or even just having conversations with people across generations. I've had great conversations with people in my own family, starting a, an action club or, or joining a local organization, writing petitions or listening to different narratives. There's a lot of different literature coming out in 2022 um, from some phenomenal um, activists and scholars. And there's really no hierarchy of action. It's just what works for you. So my form of action might look different than like Adriana's or Denisha's form of action. We each are going to take action in a way that feels best for us. Um, so I encourage you, I will send this um, link here to um, the PowerPoint slide. So if you want to take a look at it or click on some resources, most of it's in blue, or if you want, um, there's the 20 day um, challenge. So if you want to continue to educate yourself, I have many resources kind of built in, or if you want to revisit some of the questions and, and have that within your own community, um, you can um, as well. But I just want to say thank you so much. Again, thank you to Jim Burke. I know you're here. You're lab labeled the town of Windsor. Thank you so much for helping put on and promote this event um, and to the interns at the office and to our fearless chairperson, uh, Judge Kevin Washington, who is really 
done a tremendous effort to make sure we have these conversations on race within the town of Windsor. So I'll first post the link to the slides. And then I'm going to remind everyone, if you want to come next Sunday, we're going to be talking about interp the um, interpreting Windsor's Black history. So we will continue this conversation, but from a different um, perspective. So if you want to come, it's again, from 5 to 7 p.m. Eastern Time. The link will be posted on the Town of Windsor website. Um, we'll also be posting it on social media. So if you follow our Instagram or Facebook page, it'll be posted there. And the following conversation will happen on Sunday, the 27th, um, on health disparities in the Black, Indigenous, People of Color community with the focus on reproductive justice. Um, it might be a two-parter, depends, because we are bringing um, a panel of doctors <laughs> for the event. So it's going to be very, very informative. So I encourage you to come to our Black History Month events. And thank you all so much for coming tonight. Thank you, Cassie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Cassie. Awesome. All right. Oh, and you're the host. Perfect. <laughs> great job, Cassie. As as usual, you just you're just great. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I did. I'm glad that we had some people. I know as it's like it wasn't like a huge crowd, but I also know some people who said they last minute couldn't make it for whatever reasons, because sure. I know that there's the Olympics that's coming on tonight, and then there's the Super Bowl, and then I saw a bunch of other Black History events today, so it's just so much going on. <laughs> yeah, there is a lot, but uh, it's very good. Uh, so it'll this will be posted sometime in the next week, and uh, we'll get uh, the information posted for next Sunday. All right, sounds good. Yeah, I'm almost done with the slides, so I'll post those uh, or share that with the next group of panelists and people. So, or to Doug. Um, Sandra and needs those photos, I guess, for the yes. fire. So she she will be in tomorrow at noon. At noon, okay. I'll I'll reach out to Doug on that because I think he only provided Marsha's. I'm not right. sure about. Right. everybody else and I kept thinking WHS meant like Windsor High School and then I was like oh wait it's Windsor <laughs> Historical Society and I was like wow I feel dumb but oh <laughs> well, we get that confused all the time <laughs> like whoops like, yeah I'll definitely I'll reach out to Doug and then delay send an email now to say hey can you like send some pictures or um I'm not sure I think the pictures might be on the website That's